Um, thank you sure. guys so much for joining me. Um, before we get started talking about the situation, I would just like um, people to know a little more about you, Erin, and uh, the work that you do, and then <laughs> well, Bob. <laughs> Well, um, so most people know me from the movie forever ago, Aaron Brockovich. I, I hate to date myself, but it, it's been quite some time. And so after the film came out and even today, I've just continued to stay true with, you know, my environmental work, water pollution issues. For me, there's nothing more important than water. I think we all know that. When I began my work, oh my gosh, I was a young girl, I was 30, and I'm happy to tell you I'm now 60 with four grandchildren. I really thought, hey, hey, I'm sorry. I really thought that this was kind of a one-off situation. And I very quickly learned after the case, and especially after the film, that this was everywhere. I mean, it is every state in, in the US that doesn't have some water problem PFOS problem, Chrome 6 problem, TCE problem, it's just rampant. And, and through all this time, I do a lot of keynote speaking, I do a lot of teaching about maps that I've developed, how people are reporting, I get tens and thousands of emails from people, which has led to my recent book, Superman's Not Coming, because the, the solution to this can't just always be a lawsuit. The solution has to be identification. The solution has to be community organization. The solution at some deep level has to be cleanup. We are losing aquifers. They're so polluted. We're losing water. We're condemning wells. We can't redrill. I don't know what any of us is going to think, and I don't know that any of us want to believe that we could find ourselves in such a condition where we don't have aquifers, we are short of water. This is gonna be a real situation. And how we can focus on what the solution is going to be and actually taking action. It bothers me that for corporate reasons, at state and leadership reasons, things get concealed, um, they are hidden from the public, and then all of a sudden we find out we have a huge crisis, like we do in Maine. And listen, I understand this will be frustrating for people. Maine is beautiful. I have been there. And everyone thinks this extraordinarily gorgeous environment and lush land couldn't possibly be contaminated. So we've got to start with transparency. And, and we don't have time to hide anymore. We need to acknowledge we have a problem and stop making this political. This is everybody's issue and pushing for the solutions and pushing for the cleanup and pushing for how companies run their businesses and how we dispose of and deal with our hazardous waste and not just assume that the solution to pollution is dilution and it's just gonna all go away. So I continue my work. I've done my book. I'm probably gonna write another book. And the best way Bob and I have worked together for 20 years, we've learned is contact with the people, being on the ground, having community meetings and getting them organized and moving the right direction and working with local officials and state officials, municipalities on how to treat the system and get people safe water. And, and, and Bob is the expert at this and he's amazing going in and working with the municipalities, which sometimes it kind of annoys me that they don't always know what they're doing and Bob and I have talked about this so often with companies and municipalities. They always want to take a shortcut. I always learned from my dad, the long division is the way you get to the answer. The shortcuts don't always work. And they want to take the cheap route. And it's leading to this explosion of problems. And how Bob works with the municipalities, how we teach or work with companies, stop taking the shortcut, do the safety and the right thing on the upfront, and we will avoid a lot of issues like this. So for us, it's about research, it's about teaching, it's about being on the ground and getting the communities informed and them involved. 
when the collective works and rises up, they can actually make significant change. So that's kind of in a nutshell what I do, even though that was a very long winded response. <laughs> you know, I've always said water is never a soundbite. It's always a story. And we're talking about water and how I got from way back when to today is clearly a story and a journey of itself. And for me, it's um, the staggering number of polluted wells, the staggering numbers of municipality and the chemicals that are in our water supply that have been for a long time and uh, what the outcome of that's going to be. And uh, we, we just can't get everywhere. It, it doesn't stop. And, and here we are talking to you in Maine, and it got started because one community member didn't feel they were getting the answers. And they decided, well, you know, the Aaron Brockovich, and that was, you know, a good movie about water and people being poisoned. What's going on? Let's email her. So that's how you, um, you two came to know about the situation or had you heard about it before? Or was it just from the- Well, community? we're very, 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 very familiar with this chemical PFAS uh, because it's, it's so widespread. But for, for Maine, I had read an article in, in your paper. I'd even referenced it on a news show that I was on. Um, I'm like, you know, this just can't keep happening because you've got a, a chemical that bioaccumulates that you're finding in the milk, you're finding it in our products. Uh, and nobody seemed to have known. My understanding was the ball may have been dropped back with the USDA that knew this, but didn't say anything to the state until months later. Well, that, uh oh, that's kind of a problem if you ask me. But uh, then I got an email after I'd read the article and from a, a family that was concerned, and they have over a thousand, I believe it's there about 1,100. And they're like, what is going on? And so I'm like, Oh, Maine does have a problem. I just read a big article about it. So yes, the media, when they get the right information out there, are extraordinarily helpful for people finding out what might be happening to their water. And in turn, what would happen to their public health and welfare. So it was um, a family that contacted me from Maine. And here we are today. And boy, how do we know a lot more information today? Um, that's for sure. And the, they're shocked. Mm -hmm. They had no idea. Now, you say that, that you're very familiar with these chemicals. Can you give me a little bit of context? Um, how many cases you're investigating or that you're aware of in other places across the United States? That that are uh, one, two, three towns in multiple towns in every single state. In the United States, you know, we uh, were we were involved with this chemical in Hoosick Falls, New York, uh, St. Gobain. I believe that there was an issue with St. Gobain in New Hampshire, Maine, um, Bob. It was New, uh, Hampshire. Yeah. New Hampshire, New yeah. Hampshire. We've been up to New Hampshire. New Hampshire has pr true problems. Um, upstate New York, Alabama, uh, California, North Carolina. North Carolina, Minnesota. It's multiple communities in each state in the US. And uh, some of them are have higher numbers than others. We will share with you these numbers in Maine are some of the highest we've ever seen. Right. I mean, to put it in context, Molly, um, community drinking water systems began testing um, and monitoring for the PFAS suite of chemicals. It's, it's multiple chemicals. They initially began with five. We're able to test for it in drinking water now up to 30. Um, science tells us there's about 5,000 of these compounds um, in commerce today. And uh, we began regulate uh, or, or under what the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule told us was we needed to start monitoring for them in the drinking water in 2013. Um, so they became aware of them in the, in the 80s. They looked at them mm -hmm. in the 90s. The unregulated contaminant monitoring rule was part of the Safe Drinking Water Act administration changes in the Clinton administration in 96. The first UCMR, Unregulated Contaminant Monitoring Rule, began in 2000. So then we had 2005 and 2010. They said, let's look at the PFAS compounds. So, I mean, it's not, what's so frustrating is we knew what industries they were being used in. 
textiles, paper processing, firefighting foam. We knew what they were using it for, Scotch Guard, Teflon. Um, we knew it was bioaccumulating, but uh, you know the in, the chemical industry and our regulators kicked the can for 25 years, um, and and that's where it becomes sad and kind of kind of uh, frustrating and and you know dare I say pathetic. Um, but it, it's the case, you know, to answer your question directly that, that Aaron talked about, we're, we're looking at 250 cases right now, or, or situations, exposure situations in communities right now. Um, and when you get to the issue of sludge from our wastewater treatment plants, um, you're talking about every town in America. One of the things I was just, Aaron and I were on the phone with the Higgins is right before this, uh, this call. And one of the things I was sharing with them, until you start actually demonstrating removal from the environment of these toxins. And what I mean by that is, is you, can, you can say, here's a pound of chemical removed from the environment. We put our label on it. It's being sent to this processing center and it is now destroyed because of the inaction of our regulatory agencies and the mismanagement by the chemical industry of these chemicals at homes in Fairfield, we are continuously repoisoning ourselves. And how I explain that is we brought the biosolids in, we discharged them on the land, it went down and contaminated the wells adjacent to that. We pump it up, we drink it, we bathe in it, we flush our toilets, and where do they go? Septic tanks, goes right back down into the groundwater. It's that vicious cycle of recontamination of ourselves. And until we actually put our arms around it, get honest about it and remove it from our environment, we're chasing our tails. And so I know that Bob and I um, spoke on Wednesday and we went into it a little more, but um, now that Aaron's here, you know, I think we'd, it'd be good to bring up, what have you, both of you um, assessed about the situation in Fairfield so far? Um, I know that you've only begun looking at this, um, I think last week you said, but you know- Monday. <laughs> This week. So what so far have you? My uh, my assessment is is this these are the kind of scenarios that I don't want to use the word scare me, but I'm cl clearly paying attention to because they go from a one email to an explosion in a matter of days, and the more you uncover, the worse it is. And for me, that's always the worst case scenario and the most concerning because how long has this been going on and they've been uninformed and the deeper we dig it's obviously we're going to find out it's been quite some time so it's um bigger than an email that came in that starts with one that you think there's 20 or 30 that you start to realize it's going to be 50 100 150 200 and it's big so that's what's making me uncomfortable with the situation that i'm seeing here you're talking about wells? Yes, well waters. So um, one person calls, you know, I've learned um, for every one that reports, there's another hundred that don't report because they don't know. And so this is multiplying really fast in Maine that starts with one. And then the whole time there's been a little idea that, you know, 20 or 30 wells or families are impacted and it's rapidly looking like 50 or 100 or 150. Um, and how, how far behind is the state running and testing and getting out and reading all of these wells? And it's always concerning when you start to uncover the first well that came in had readings of 1100, which of this chemical, P, the PFOS. It's concerning because that's a high number. And now we're looking at numbers at 11,000. Those are significantly high numbers. And part of the problem, and it's just gonna be my mantra this year. Look, I made a reference about corporations and municipalities and needing to get caught up and be transparent. We have a problem uh, with the system as a whole and how we're dealing with our environment, uh, even within the EPA. And listen, there's well-meaning, good intention, very intelligent people there, but it's kind of how the system is set up. We have antiquated rules, antiquated policies, and antiquated infrastructure in this country. 
And we need to get busy addressing that. This whole PFOA, PFC was an issue back by 3M and DuPont, knowing that their studies were showing it caused cancer in rabbits and dogs, that by the time it gets to the EPA, they set a guideline, a guideline. It's not a law. It's not a maximum contaminant limit. And we teach all of this. But their hands are somewhat tied because they've been notified. we got a chemical out here that's going to be a problem. See, I don't know sometimes any way to speak other than just my actual direct language. We are doing it ass backwards. We need the studies on the upfront what these chemicals will do before we ever put them into the environment. But we let them into the environment first, knowing with a warning, keep your eye on this, it's gonna be a problem. So you set some arbitrary, uh, okay, 400 parts per trillion of this chemical can be in the water and run through the municipalities. So the municipalities are all notified and they, they run it through their system up to 400 parts per trillion. Well, then what happens with the EPA is they now have to raise the money and commission a study and raising money for studying one chemical costs millions of dollars. And then it takes them many, many years to do the study to conclude. And this is what happened with PFAS. This chemical is a perfect role model and example of how we are doing things wrong. So now you've known you had a dangerous chemical. It's taken you years and years to study, decades. This didn't just show up yesterday. These didn't just show up in the wells of Maine yesterday. It's been there. So here we are in 2006. Guess what? Science catches up with policy. That's what I've always said it is. And they have to make a phone call to the EPA and go, whoa, we have a problem. Oh, shocker, you've let a chemical, a toxic chemical run rampant and you're shocked that the science just caught up and said, this causes testicular cancer, thyroid cancer, high cholesterol, plethora of problems been widely used on military bases. It's run rampant through our municipal systems. It's sitting in well water. So the EPA is like, oh my gosh, who knew? And I'm sorry that that sounds like cynical, but I really feel that way. What were you possibly thinking? You were warned this is a dangerous situation. And here it happened. You let the horse out of the barn. Now getting it back is not going to be easy. So. This one chemical, and there's thousands of chemicals. This is how we're operating this system. We want companies to change and do it right on the upfront. We're gonna look at municipalities. You're gonna do it on the upfront, right? They rely on the information coming down from the EPA. We need to change the process of how we're letting known toxic chemicals into our environment. And on the upfront say, no, <laughs> you're gonna give us some studies first. My gosh, we require that of the FDA, but not at the EPA with chemicals, toxic chemicals in our water that we're drinking is ridiculous. And I, I just really felt that I needed to say that. And I know people say I'm picking on them, but it is time we look at this and be honest about it. And, and, and the EPA, over decades cannot continue to operate the way they are letting the chemicals in first and doing something about it later this, that's why we're in this mess you started out molly saying that you know you were gonna you, you were reaching out to sappy and, and hopefully you'll reach out to the china you know parent company uh in finland but they actually have a u.s office and you can call the plant there in, in waterville um we're not anti those those corporations those corporations um, are a part of the, the, the pollution process. Um, some of the people in those corporations knew what they were doing was wrong. Some of the people in those corporations had no clue what was going on. Um, that's in the past. Aaron and I are about the future. We will sit down at the table with those corporations and Absolutely. help them. And we'll save them millions of dollars in cleaning up their mess. Absolutely. You know, they, can do it the, they can do it the right way or they can do it the wrong way. They can do it the easy way or they can do it the hard way. They can do it the 
economically feasible and affordable way, or they can do it the expensive and painful way. And, and we want to help them as much as, as they should want to help the community that they've affected. Now, we've always said that, and it's really true. You know, we've all give me corporate America, you know, uh, all these industries, every one of us appreciates what they've brought to the table. And, and this isn't throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You oftentimes need to be told what to do right after you've done it. And, you know, this kind of behavior just needs to completely stop. We are here to help you. Your community, they appreciate the jobs you bring. We all appreciate having lights. We all appreciate being able to have this conversation now. We're not asking you to go away, but we are asking you to meet us in the middle, work with the community, work with the leadership, work with us, don't work against us, to clean this mess up so we can move forward more sustainable. I think that there is this old business model idea that if you just keep kicking the can down the line, that's the way they're going to handle it. That's not working out well for you because we have billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars down here at the end of the line where you didn't address the issue. And had you done it on the upfront, the environment would have been saved people's health could have been saved and your company would have saved billions of dollars. It makes me think of PG&E. You just keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. So we are here and we do extend our hand. Work with us. Now, with your assessment of the Fairfield situation, who is the polluter that you believe is causing such high levels of PFAS to show up in these wells? I think there's going to be a couple. One is going to be uh, sappy. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got two different situations. One's going to be China down below. Um, I think part of the problem in Maine, and I brought it up, was with the USDA. Okay. If you knew the milk had it in it and you knew what was going on in that dairy, that's significant lag time from getting that information to the state. That could enact the state to have gone out and started getting ahead of this plume and um, finding ways to draw it back and to keep other wells from being exposed. So they've just been sitting ducks out there, but there's gonna be a couple of potential, you know, if you're gonna talk about a litigation defendants, and if you're gonna talk about at a leadership level um, and your state and your health department, there's gonna be a couple of companies that they're probably gonna to need to get busy working with mm -hmm. on a cleanup. Mm -hmm. So it's, yes, so the sappy plant, in the Somerset Mill plant. And Bob, you mentioned the Hudamaki plant in Waterville that produces China. Correct. Yes. Correct. And and so people are gonna say, oh, but it was the it was the uh, sanitary district, the, the Kennebec Sanitary District who who brought their biosolids to the facility and and then you know basically disked them in and made them part of the uh, the agricultural uh, process there. Um, unfortunately um, what what people fail to recognize is industrial dischargers are part of a pretreatment program and they're actually regulated under the National Pollution Elimination Discharge System NPDES program as an industrial discharger. So even though they went through the community's sanitary sewer treatment program, um, they still have the ultimate responsibility from cradle to grave. They own that chemical from the day it showed up on their, their facility till the day um, it made it into the farm and into those groundwater wells. As a matter of fact, they still own it um, um, in those wells that are contaminating uh, are contaminated today. Now, I want to talk about sludge from the industrial side of it. So sure. there's been a lot of discussion about sludge. And I want to know, how was this sold as a benefit if there is now we are seeing such toxic chemicals that could be in this sludge? How was it? Was it marketed as um, an agricultural benefit? And who, who were the people telling farmers and people who were growing food and livestock that this was a good thing? Well, and I know I, Bob's gonna answer that too, but this is not the first time we've seen, and it's kind of surprising. You wouldn't even think about sludge, right? You know, and I've often wondered what we do with all of our hazardous waste besides just dump it down the water. Well, what a great- 
<laughs> yeah, you're not supposed to. What a creative way to create something else in a sledge. And in Cameron, Missouri, we had a very similar situation with hexavalent chromium, where a tannery was taking all the sledge and spreading it on the fields. Sometimes the farmers don't know. Um, I've been told that a lot of coal ash is being sold as backfill and topsoil for farmers, kind of in a sludge base over in North Carolina. We're seeing a lot of pollution issues from that. So the, the sludge, how it gets to the farmer, you know, oftentimes we learn from the farmer how it did or didn't happen, or a friend recommended it, or somebody hauled it. They're unsuspecting, but somebody like sappy you know you wouldn't think okay we got paper mills and a sludge where would pfs pfos and all of that become involved but because they use so much water and they're aerating it they create this sludge and uh, bob might know better than i but i will tell you in past experiences of this uh the farmers the landscapers uh, developers oftentimes they don't know um it's just being packaged as sludge and i don't know that we just go to a place oh gosh should we check for hexavalent chromium or PFOS or perfluorooctanoic acid, something I can't even pronounce half the time, is in the sludge. So it, it, again, it's that lack of transparency. Uh, it's that secrecy. Um, and oftentimes people are unknowing what they are spreading on their fields. Now, are that, that, that's my, that's just my lay person's take on my past experiences. Uh, and, and we wouldn't even think about Sludge, you know, uh, being spread as fertilizer. The the concept of fertilizer. I mean, fertilizer by definition is is waste. Um, if you go and buy a bag of fertilizer for your garden at uh, the local hardware store, um, you know, it's predominantly from cattle. You know, it's cattle. We waste. think of waste as poop. If you're well, going to tell me fertilizer, that's what the average Joe over here thinks. I don't stop to think that my fertilizer has got Roundup, PFOS, and Chrome 6 in it. It does. It does. If you buy a five-pound bag at your local hardware store, it could be from human waste, not cattle waste. What's being land applied from these, these community wastewater treatment plants um, to these fields is human waste. Um, now, what is the responsibility of that sludge management program? And, and, and Molly, you shared with me, and I've, I've gone through that list of, of all the land application fields in the state of Maine. It's pretty astonishing. Um, I'm gonna say something pretty bold. I probably wouldn't have said last year, but having had Aaron and I deal with biosolid <laughs> sludge um, as either a product or as something that's used in agriculture, um, multiple times now and with various chemicals. Uh, uh, I, I think that the land application of sludge in the United States should be subject of an emergency order by whatever branch of government it takes to cease immediately. Um, it, it's got to stop. This is not the first time, you know, Aaron and I have shared with you before, um, we had a situation in Missouri where a mm -hmm. leather cannery was actually producing sludge that was um, in the tens of thousands of parts per million of chrome eight, um, chrome six. And um, they actually tried to sell it as a product, but the farmers wouldn't pay for it. Um, they backed off and started just giving it to them. And because of it coming from the cattle industry, um, it had a lot of protein in it. Um, the predominant nutrients found in biosolids or, or cattle waste or steer manure or, or our own manure um, mm -hmm. is, is nitrogen and phosphorus. And those are the two ingredients that plants need to grow. So it does have a benefit. The protein that was coming from the uh, leather tannery um, had an added benefit. It's basically organic chemistry. Um, and so those nutrients are what cause plants to grow and, and grow more robust. Um, and, and farmers buy fertilizer, they buy ammonia and they buy mm -hmm. phosphorus to spread on their fields. And what they do is they'll take a, a, an analysis of their soils and they'll say, this is the nitrogen levels, this is the phosphorus levels. And if they've land applied sludge, they don't have to spend as much money on fertilizer. So what would normally take 5,000 tons uh, to do a massive uh, agricultural operation may only take you know 3,000 tons. So you save all that money on purchasing um, the fertilizers from the fertilizer industry. Um, so and it's, shortcut, it's, take the cheap way on the upfront. 
it's yeah. big business. Unfortunately, what's happening, I want to make sure I make this point with you because it's something that's very important. What happens is, is in particular areas, we've identified in, in Fairfield, Maine, the issue with PFAS. Okay, if they're applying that much biosolids that's bringing PFAS down into the groundwater production zone or the groundwater wells that these, these consumers are drinking with, um, and it's coming from a wastewater treatment plant that's associated with, it's a community's wastewater. Every time you flush your toilet in, in Fairfield and it goes to that wastewater treatment plant, um, it's being mixed with the waste from the Chinette paper factory, and then it's making and accumulating in this sludge. Well, that tells me what also is in that sludge is caffeine from my morning coffee, whatever other pharmaceuticals I might be taking. So I will tell you that I could probably find in a sample in Fairfield's water now, since I've got a tracer called PFAS, I could probably find uh, heart medicine, chemotherapy drugs, um, Viagra, uh, you name it, I'll find it in your drinking water and it's all coming from that same sludge. Now, the so, sludge. yeah, this is the ultimate question we've always asked. What truly are we doing with their hazardous waste? We just found another way to recycle it and create another problem. Now, we need to find a solution to get rid of it. <laughs> there are many solutions out there. It just costs you a dollar more. The, um, what's it called? I'm sorry. Um, That's okay. the organic benefits. That's the organic benefits that you were talking about with the municipal sludge. Um, I know that when we had a conversation earlier, this week, we were discussing the industrial sludge. Is that the same? Is that, is that what is happening in Fairfield? Are they taking the industrial sludge from the paper plants? Are they mixing it with the municipal sludge? Are they? No, 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 no. Okay. So at the sappy paper mill, mm -hmm. okay, they are not connected to the community wastewater system. Mm -hmm. They have their own mm -hmm. independent wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. It is very large scale. Okay. Mm -hmm. From that, the wastewater is, is then sent to two major uh, aeration ponds. Okay, mm -hmm. and those two major aeration ponds um, cover 15 acres of land, mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit more. I mean, I was able to, to kind of measure them from a Google Earth photograph, but they look like they're about 15 acres in size. Mm -hmm. so, so that water that's in those is contaminated with PFAS. And then the sludge associated with that, the sludge produced at that wastewater treatment plant at the sappy place mm -hmm. is also land applied independent of the Kennebunk sanitary sewer system. Now the Kennebunk sanitary sewer system is the toilets from everybody in the city that's not on a septic tank that just flushes their toilets into the, the septic or into the sanitary sewer system there. And added to that is the wastewater from the Chinette factory. So you have two sources. Some were applied to land at, at some locations Others were applied to land at other, at other locations. Right now, I've counted about 25 specific locations where either Sappies directly deposited their sludge or Kennebunk Sanitary District deposited their sludge. So it's, it's occurred at many locations in the area. My other fear is those aeration ponds are likely percolating into the groundwater aquifer. They're supposed to have a monitoring program but I will tell you historically, I've never found one that has not leaked into the groundwater aquifer. Um, that's, that's one of the subjects of Aaron's fame is the ponds at Hinkley, California, where they would discharge the cooling tower wastewater and it percolated chrome six down into the aquifer. Not unlike what's happening at the Sappy plant. So you have 25 land application fields of Kennebuck sanitary sewer discharge and sappy discharge and leaking aeration ponds. And so all three. Now, are these chemicals found in industries that aren't that isn't paper making? I know that we again we spoke that are we um, they're found typically in paper and pulp making because they spray on for you know water resistance. What are some other industries that use these chemicals? Um, any, any clothing that has wicking on it, you know, that, you know, the, the waterproof clothing, you know, like your Patagonia jacket, um, safe Scotch guard, 
Scotch guard on your furniture. Furniture. Carpeting. Yep. Carpet, furniture, clothing, sleepwear. Most everything we pick up and drink out of our little paper or china cups to go. Bob, what's you drinking out of there? China. <laughs> uh, there you go. The, it's not in this one anymore. Um, I think I don't know whether I've shared with you, Molly. Yeah, the recycle. I don't know that you did. Yeah, the recycle thing. So I don't know whether if, if you go on the China uh, uh, factory uh, recycled product uh, spec sheet, it says and unintentional PFAS chemicals. And the reason for that is, is the PFAS is now in the recycled paper stock, the commodity recycled paper. You know, recycled cans and recycled bottles and recycled paper are all commodities now. And so Chinette is, is uh, it sells recycled products, your egg cartons, your uh, uh, recycled paper bowls, your recycled paper plates made from 100% recycled. Well, because the historic recycled stock of paper had PFAS in it, it says may contain unintentionally added PFAS. It says it on their cut sheet today. So they're still processing PFAS. It's part of the recycle, so they don't have to name it anymore. Now, kind of shifting away from the industries that should be held accountable for the situation happening. I know that the state has been working on this since last February when they first ran retail milk samples and found high levels of PFAS and that's how they got back to the Toji Dairy Farm. Now, if you could speak to DEP directly, what would you tell them that they need to do right now to address this situation? Well, Bob's going to tell you a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I, you need to get ahead of it. Uh, you know, and and I want to look. No situation is going to be perfect, but you know, you got a problem. You own that and get busy trying to get ahead of it and getting all the information out. Don't withhold information. Don't delay information and get a team together quickly down on the ground and identify the magnitude of this plume so you know what you're dealing with that for me is is what they need to do quickly uh is uh, so they can try to get ahead of this problem i don't know that they are because this has been going on for a while but for gosh sakes get out there immediately and at least identify the magnitude of the problem and be honest about it yeah, if they could get in and and uh, and that's the three things that I've been talking to them about. It's just like those that have already been identified as contaminated sources for the, the consumers in the community, um, get the right treatment equipment on. Make sure that their plumbing systems have been cleared out of all the PFAS contamination, i.e. the sludge in their hot water heaters. Um, then the next thing is, is um, start building confidence in the community about the land that's been destroyed and the land application problems. So somebody owns those 25 fields that have been uh, land applied and, and they've likely, uh, they're likely gonna be a big problem uh, as we move forward in the future. When you need and to move quickly for every single independent well owner to get the yes. appropriate filtration, and I know that's where Bob was going, the first thing that they need to do is identify the, the magnitude of it, but you've got to get those people clean water. Period. And, and the filtration system that you put on it is clearly important. And Bob works a lot on that issue. And I know he's talked to the state about it. I think the state's um, doing the right thing. I want to be very clear. I'm, I'm very encouraged by where they're going with this. Mm -hmm. Now, my next step of that is to get them to get out there and identify all the plumes so that we yeah. can stop the plume migration. And a plume is the groundwater that's contaminated down there. It's moving like a big blob. And it, it's going to head in your direction. And I want to stop it. You have a way to draw it back. We've done that out in Hinkley, California with hexavalent chromium and through pumping been able to draw it back. Correct. So um, I, I, I think that they're on the right track for, for sure I agree with Bob, but that's what they need to do. And, and they are starting to do it, but it, it, I think it's the more they do it, the bigger they're gonna find it. So the quicker you find that, that boundary and can start pushing it back and getting the filtration systems on, every one of those wells. And I think it's really important. It might be a bigger conversation too. You know, we have over 40 million Americans on well water. It's a system off the grid. And I have to tell you every single case that I've gotten involved in, if we're going to talk about it becoming a case, has the highest readings and the worst impact in well water 
off the grid and nobody seems to know what's going on. And I think that states need to change their testing programs on everybody's well water so we can catch these things a lot earlier. And the last question, what would you say to the residents that are feeling lost and hopeless and feeling like no one is listening? What would you tell them or any sense of reassurance about the problem? Well, you're not alone in your feeling, uh, your neighbors and uh, even out in Hinkley, California, to this day, every community we get involved in, what my message would be to them is there's always hope. Uh, there's going to be more hope now that it's out in the open. And for you as an individual or a neighborhood or a community, don't ever think that you can't get involved in this. And, and this is my biggest message and clearly what I've learned in every single community I've gone to. You don't have to have any specific science degree or medical degree to understand that there's a poison in your well water or by your own observation, what's happening to your dairy farm or your cattle or your animals or concerns about their chickens or their goats or their own health and welfare to get curious, ask questions, get involved and don't be afraid to talk to your neighbor. You've got this and oftentimes once it's out and they find one and then five and then 15 and 20, they get a momentum going. Don't be afraid to show up at your own city council. I mean, after all, this is your land, your water, your health, your your livestock. Um, you don't have to be anything other than to be that and human to know or see or learn that there's an issue and for you to act. And when you do it together, you can make significant change. And we've seen it happen over and over and over again. We've had situations here in California and Carson, California, where down at city council, I mean, this community, we couldn't get a cleanup order and we worked to organize with them and brought thousands of them into the meeting. And I'll tell you the change it made because there was a cleanup order in the morning. We oftentimes assume that the city council or someone does know what's going on. Well, they're not mind readers. So it's up to us and we the people to show up and let them know. I've seen city council go, oh my, I really had no idea that was going on. So wherever the ball gets dropped, uh, when it lands in your backyard, pick it up, work with it, run with it. And no, you don't have to have all these big fancy degrees behind your name to, to know exactly and precisely what's wrong within yourself or in your own backyard, work with your neighbors and start at a very local level. And, and you're seeing that happen already. They're already starting to talk around out there a lot. And the more they do, the stronger they feel. And I always say, people often will write to me. I think they're looking for permission. Am I on the right track? I don't want to be the, you know, the one that raises my hand. And I've got the wrong answer. What they're really looking for is support. So support yourself and what you know and your community. And again, when the ball rolls in your yard, don't just look at it. Pick it up and take some action. Bob, anything? No, I, I couldn't agree with her more. That's that's her soapbox she likes to get on. And she does a great job. Soapbox! Oh my God, I just sat here and listened to your soapbox. I'm like, hey, Bob. <laughs> you know, Bob and I have been together a very, very, very long time. And, and it is true. Uh, I've been a community community meetings, there's nobody better than Bob on, on the science on so many of these things. When it comes to water, uh, I, I've learned, listen, if to talk about disinfection byproduct rules, the minute it comes out of his mouth, I'm like, oh no, here we go. Because I'm like everybody else is like, oh, we're getting into the organic chemistry. This is overwhelming. And he and I were at a meeting and, and I, I connect very much with the community and I observe their reactions, what they're thinking, who's pulling away, why. And he kept talking about this organic matter. And I could see them going, oh, I was going, oh, here we go. This organic matter, what is it? This is some big science question. And they kind of fade away. So I talked to Bob and, and Bob and I just have straight talk and I'm like, dude, what is it with this organic matter? What are we, come on, Bob, what are we talking about, Mr. Scientist? And he's like, well, organic matter is dirt. Oh my gosh. And so when he says to the communities now, organic matter, and I can see him go, what is this? He goes, it's dirt. They're like, 
oh, I got it. So sometimes if we can just speak straight with people who are afraid or get lost in the science or the math and the minute they do, they think they can't do it and then they kind of move away or they're scared, it's dirt. And if we can explain so much of this in layman's terms, and Bob is excellent at it, they get it and they will respond. So, soapbox star. Uh, I think that's all the questions that I had. Um, is there anything that you would like to add? Uh, I'm gonna add something for you, Molly. Thank you. And I said in the beginning, and we're gonna end with it. When a community gets together and and the media can get involved or a good local reporter that stays with them, it makes a large difference in how they're heard and how far spread it goes. So thank you for being involved and I mean that. Thank you. Yep, very nice. Great work actually. I mean, I've read, yes. since, since you've been involved, I've read every article that you've written and it's been, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. So, and thank you so much for making some time to talk with me today and um, I'll talk to you guys soon. Great. You will. Don't be surprised if you see one of us. So that might be Bob sooner than you think. <laughs> That's fine. We're still in connection. So yep. we'll, uh, we'll talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, Molly. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.